Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can see me and hear me. That's our next webinar about object-oriented programming. Uh, let me check. Uh, let me ask if everybody can see me now. Um, we're going to discuss fluent interfaces. I wrote a blog post about them just a few weeks ago and I criticized them. So I, in the blog post I explained that even though I was a big fan of them quite just a few years ago and I created a number of open source libraries uh, which were based on fluent interface concepts, now I don't find them uh, I don't find them uh, object-oriented anymore. And that's what I'm going to show you. And I will show you the alternative now. So the point of, today, of today's webinar is not just to discuss them, but also to demonstrate how we can replace them with what. And uh, actually, I was triggered to make this library, which I'll show you now, uh, at the... Uh, at the, at the blog post comment section. So somebody, actually a few people told me there that asked me there whether I can suggest some improvement for the, uh, for the HTTP client library, which I, my library, which I criticized in the blog post. And uh, I said that even though I created that library, I think four years ago, uh, with, the, with the idea of fluent interfaces, and I'll show you this library right now, uh, I don't like it anymore because it's difficult to maintain it. So that's my key, key, key uh, point in the article and in this, um, um, in the, this fight against fluid interfaces is that they are very convenient for end users. They are not very convenient, but they are convenient. But however, they are difficult to maintain. And I'll give an example. So let's go to uh, see the code of uh, of the JKB HTTP. Probably you know this library and you have maybe some experience of using it. Uh, on the surface it looks really convenient. So if you look at the example, that's for example. So this is how you make uh, an HTTP request. So you create a request. Well, actually this one is kind of sort of optimized. I don't know. Anyone. We can try uh, like any test. Uh, they all creating it. Yeah, again, let's try this one. So to make an HTTP request, basically what you do is you, um, we can do it like this. I'll touch the code a little bit. So you make uh, you make a, an instance of this class, uh, providing the target URI of where the request should be sent to, and then you say fetch, and then you do some manipulations with them. With after the, with you you do some manipulations with the response, but you can make it uh, bigger. For example, you want to change the method, so you say okay, it's going to be put or post, and I want to uh, to add some body. So I'm saying, well, let's let's not start with the body. I want to. Uh, to add some header and I'm saying content type let's say text plain I, I just assume you're familiar with the HTTP protocol if you're not then maybe this webinar will be difficult for you to understand so I'm suggesting you to read about it first and then come back again uh, we can add uh, more headers let's like say I want to I say user agent and I'll say okay it's me talking here uh, I want to say that, you know, the timeout. So I want to give some timeout parameters for the request. The fluent, why it's called, why this, this, this whole thing is called, is called fluent interface, is that each method I'm calling here is actually returning an instance of the same original class. So I created an instance of this class, JDK request, and when I call method, look at if I hover it like this um, then I will let me yeah so when uh, when I say dot method then what it this 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 uh, method returns is actually an instance of class request as well and the header also returns the request and then the timeout returns the request 
and only the fetch returns the response but then all of these guys return me the response again all different kinds of responses but they all returns response response somehow so the, it called it called fluent because the method calls a go like this they they they, they go fluently uh, one after another and you don't need to uh, you don't need to uh, to break this sequence and start a new statement this whole thing looks like one giant statement with the one semicolon in the end it, it looks convenient for the user right because you just start with the first line and then you you basically go with the flow and 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 the the way you think uh, the way your code looks it is procedural definitely because you define them like step by step you you, you tell it what to do maybe this these guys are not actually doing anything until the fetch is called so they are basically building the JD the, the request so so until here until this line we're we're dealing with the with the builder pattern you know the builder pattern in object-oriented programming where we are calling more and more methods and every time returning a bigger object or um, or object with more information inside uh, it, it, it could be immutable object or it can be mutable it, for example the, um, the string builder is a perfect example of the fluent interface as well so if I say new string builder and then I say my name is so that will build that will build me a string when I say to string here then uh, the string will be built and this is a perfect example of the uh, of the builder pattern and it's fluent interface and it is mutable so this builder pattern it is mutable so if I stop here and I say to string then uh, I mean uh, we are so it's not it's not creating this string builder is not creating a new string builder every time on each method call it doesn't return me a new instance it just changes something in internally in some internal buffer or internal storage and then return me itself so if I click here I will see you see this line it says return this so it returns me the same object not the new one as it happens here in case of my fluent interface so every time you say click you see it says well it says something it's I cannot yeah it we, we can we can trace it now but I assure you that what happens here is that it creates a new object uh, the beauty of that is that of course uh, mutable things are difficult to you more difficult to use because you always need to remember that uh, that when you change something then uh, the previous object you had before also changed so if you if you if you say for example uh, uh, like, like the string builder string builder text uh, let's say hello and then I say uh, and then I say text Yegor and then I say Jeff so it seems that it looks from this code it may look like it's gonna print hello Yegor hello Jeff right but in reality it will print me hello you can see what it prints I can remove this it will it will do something not really unexpectable but if you understand it's mutable it will be expectable but for for me on the first sight because I'm used to immutable objects this code looks a little bit the, the behavior of this code will not really be predictable sorry it's just compiling the whole library now uh, if 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 the string builder would be immutable then we would see definitely hello Yegor hello Jeff but here look look what's going on uh, it says I don't know why it was executed twice oh yeah because it's a parameterized test it doesn't matter but look this is the second line 
because because you understand but when you say text app, append uh, yegor the original this one this object has been modified inside so the state of this object is changed and then you append jeff and it's changed again which which makes the code kind of dirty because you need to remember that uh, if somewhere below this line somewhere blah 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 a hundred lines of code here and then and then it, let's say the code looks like this so I created a text and then somewhere down the line I, I do this and then I, I forget about that line and I put this line in here because yeah I want to get the text in here and print it I will change something which happens here so it creates confusion that's my point mutability creates confusion there are many articles about that not only me saying that so uh, but that's still a builder pattern I just removed it so that string builder it's still a builder but mutable this one is immutable from the which is which is better um, so every time we're creating a new object and you can you can you can every time you deal with it you deal with something new uh, it looks perfect how on the on the surface for the user however inside when you implement that that interface when you work with the code and I'm I'm sitting now on the on the side of a developer of the article of the maintainer of the of, of the um, of the library uh, for me it's it's really difficult to extend it and add new functionality I can show you I can show you well I I did it in the article in the blog post and I can do it again probably uh, but what happens is that if I have this method, for example, post, and then I have the header, like we've seen before, or timeout. And let's say I want to add new line, a new, you know, a, a new method which will modify this object. Obviously, I will need to go in here and add it to the interface, which is called request, which already has a lot of methods a lot one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven eleven methods which is a lot and we have a number of classes which implement that interface one two three four five six so there are six classes so if i want to add there was timeout here look so if i say i want to add um, something else there then i have to add it here and then in all the six classes in there and if somebody from the outside world also implemented uh, this interface in their libraries in their code then everything will be crashed so it's a huge dependency on this core interface this interface we all depend on and it's not small as it is now and the library is quite primitive I'm talking about just making HTTP requests which is not a, a, a complex problem to solve it's just a really primitive protocol uh, if you do something more complex, something bigger, then your interface will contain, like, look at this stream interface from Stream API in Java 8. There are 40 cloud, there are 40 methods in there, 40, 40. That's too much for a single interface, definitely too much. And, and still the problem is not huge for the streams. It's just processing of some, you know, of, of some elements coming in the stream. So it's not such a big deal. But still, there are 40, 40 methods. If you want to add something new, you need to add the method number 41. And then you change everything which depends on this interface. You, I mean, you change all the classes that, that implement that interface. So it creates a lot of hassle. And it's not really object-oriented because, yeah, having already having 11 methods in one interface, it's not an object-oriented programming. It's something is wrong. Something goes wrong. And I started to feel it. When, when I started to design that library, everything was right because I had like five methods in there. And I thought, wow, great, five methods. I had like this one, that one, and uh, yeah, a few more. But then I put it on the market like four years ago and people started to use it and they, were, they started to ask me to add some new functionality. I remember we put this timeout method here. We put this multi-part multi, multi -part body method here. We created... Uh, uh, this one, uh, yeah, this one was created as well. So there are three of them were added there by, by the request of people. And also, originally when I started that, I also solved the problem of too many methods with these helper classes. Look, I have this body and I have URI. 
so I already and I have yeah and then multi-part body as well so I didn't want to put the body the HTTP request body modifications method right in this interface so I created this method body which returns request body which is another interface which has one two three four five six seven methods and the method back so to modify the body what I'm doing this is a workaround actually so I want to provide the body of the request so what I'm saying is I'm doing like this this is how we fix the problem of not of not making the, 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 the core interface too big so instead it would be possible to do it like this like many like many people are doing set body set something so move all the methods we have in request body all these seven guys here look these seven methods I can move them to the request interface and it will be even bigger it will become not 11 but 17 or 18 methods and then I have also request URI method look that's another another eight or something I also can move it there and in that case the request would be huge just like these guys did for the stream API they they thought that 40 is not a problem for the interface like 40 whatever 400 no problem I don't think it's right well that's why I tried to find a workaround I didn't I didn't do it right as well but still I get I I, I made some workaround so that's what I did body body returns me something new then I said and then I'm clicking and I'm saying back I'm returning back to the original uh, to the original object which we started from it's a workaround which which we can use the same approach I think is uh, is what uh, uh, I, I borrowed it from the jQuery so in jQuery they I think so correct me if I'm wrong I'm not a JavaScript expert but I think in jQuery they have this method up uh, yeah if when you go through uh, when you go um, uh, through the XM HTML elements deeper and deeper and then you want to move up then you, you're saying like up which which returns you back to the to the original uh, to the original element something similar is here but it's not it's a workaround it's not good because because in the end you you end up with with problems of uh, uh, of size so everything grows in size and it's difficult to maintain and every time you're you depend on these interfaces which are inevitably become bigger and big interfaces is a huge problem in object-oriented programming the small the smaller your interfaces are the better is your code the bigger they are the bigger is the problem it means that something goes wrong I said it many times so if your interface contains more than three methods then that's that's a that's a that's a signal for you and it's time to to do something with it so getting back to the main topic of this discussion uh, uh, I created another library which I which is object-oriented the way it is the way it should be uh, something happened here uh, let me switch switch the screen yeah there you go so I called it cactus you probably know about cactus which is the um, object-oriented uh, Java primitives uh, which we have for different purposes mostly input output uh, list collection iterable maps processing um, and basically it we have a few libraries created not by myself but a few people uh, a few other people who are you know who like the concept of cactus I know one cactus math and I know cactus crypto uh, maybe there are some others but I'm aware of this too which are following the concept of cactus and they are using cactus primitives but they are adding something on top of that so I like this strategy we can go further and create more of this cactus uh, uh, cactus uh, family of projects uh, keep the cactus the core cactus small the smaller the better you, you understand that in general that the smaller the projects are the smaller repositories are the smaller interfaces are the smaller teams are the better in general the smaller microservices are 
Um, so the same here. So I created HTTP, HTTP client uh, in an object-oriented way. Mm, and I'll show you, I'll show you the design. It's not complete because I just created it yesterday. I just created a number of classes. I designed the concept, and there are a lot of a lot of things which are not done yet. And I'm asking you to take a participation in it and submit your pull requests and, and improve the library. Now it's quite primitive. What I started with is the concept of uh, um, request, response, and wire. So let me show you how it works. So, uh, yeah, I'm testing it. I'll show you a bit later how I'm testing it. Let's make a simple request to to Google, for example. Uh, so first, well, I'll explain you how I was thinking. HTTP product call. I'll just explain you my, you know, how my thoughts were going, and I was, you know, looking at the problem from an object-oriented perspective. So I was thinking, look, the, the HTTP protocol is uh, HTTP 1 or 1.1. I'm not talking about HTTP 2 now, but we'll keep it in mind for the future. Uh, HTTP is basically, I'm the client, I have a server, I send something to the server, and something is coming back. So it's a set of transactions. I, it's transactional protocol. So I send you my request and you send me the response. Then I can send you a request again, then you send me the response again. In HTTP 1, every time to do that, we open a new socket, TCP uh, socket, which, uh, which is a transport for us, uh, where these requests, requests and response are coming, are coming in and coming out. So I open a TCP socket, I push the request, and then I'm, the response is coming back, and I close the socket. That's HTTP 1. HTTP 2 is when I open the socket, send a request, get a response, and send a new request, and send and get a new response. So I don't, I don't open the socket um, for each request, which is, mm, you know, better for, which is helpful for, uh, you know, more complex uh, interactions between the client and the server, because opening socket is an expensive operation. So now, uh, my object-oriented abstractions is that I think that the request is a piece of data and the response is another piece of data. So there are two abstractions which I have in mind. Request, a piece of data, and response, a piece of data. And I have some sort of a connector between me and, the, and, the, uh, and, and the, that, that host, which is somewhere. So I decided to create a wire A wire means a wire between me and the host. And I created an interface wire and I did it like, let's, let's call my blog on port number 80. So basically wire is, uh, is an address where the host is located. It's, a, it's an internet address. And this is the TCP port of HTTP protocol, TCP port 80. So that's the wire. And then in the wire, if to the wire, I can, uh, I can, there's only one method I created. I send some input there and uh, some, something will come back. So let's say I send there uh, and then I, I need an input. Input is a class from Cactus. So it's an abstraction of some piece of data. Input means that it's possible to read from it. So there's somebody has to prepare a piece of data which is ready to go to the wire. And let's make, we have, um, we have a simple uh, primitive, hello world. It's not really HTTP now, it's just a piece of text. So I send it and something will come back. Okay, so let's see what will come back. Mm. We can convert the, the input to the text. That's it. That's how I see the interaction between the, the, the former, the host, and the local, uh, and my computer. This HT wire will implement this socket opening, socket closing, 
thing. I can click here and show what, what's going to happen here. Look, it's quite simple. Uh, you open the socket and then you prepare the input for the, for, from the source and then you open the input stream of the socket, you open the output stream of the socket, then you do a simple cycle of reading and writing, actually only reading, so only, only writing. So we're pushing data uh, to the socket and then what comes out of the socket, we, we read the entire, the, the full set of bytes from there and we convert to, to the input. It's primitive, it's not really correct now because it's going to work only on small pieces of data because if the output, for example, or the input will be huge, it's not going to fit into memory. Well, the input is okay. If I give a huge piece of data here, it will go like byte by byte. But the result is consumed, you know, as a huge uh, monster uh, piece of memory for the data. So implementation is primitive. That's, that's actually what I will ask you to help me to refactor. And there will be tickets for that. You can join the project and you can help me, you know, help us to refactor that and make this code better. But for now, for the, pro for the, for the, uh, for the prototype, it's good enough. So let's try to run it and see what the server will tell us. It's a server actually of GitHub. So now the request will go to GitHub and let's see what the GitHub will tell us. I don't know, I, don't, I didn't try it before. Uh, you see it's not answering we are just waiting because it's not http protocol this hello world is not really how http works so most likely the github now the the, the http server on the github side is waiting for some extra data so let's make our request more you know look more like http well actually look like http so let's just say get and then let's make it primitive so let's get the robots page I have it there for sure. See, he doesn't like it. Uh, I don't know why. Well, it's it's still not it's still not HTTP because we need we need to end it. It has to be a little bit more complex to be HTTP. So it needs. Uh, number of lines and it needs the host uh, I think that should be enough like this he doesn't like me It's staying and waiting for something else. These guys on, on the GitHub side. My site is hosted there on GitHub. I think that should work. Nope. Maybe I'm wrong here. I always, you know, having troubles with this. Okay, help me guys. Let's see in the chat, maybe somebody will tell me something. Okay, nobody knows anything. Uh, let me let me see the wire is supposed to go there uh, And it stays and waits. This is pretty fresh. I I've never I I haven't tested it on the foreign uh, servers.
let's do some debugging then to make sure we we actually managed to push everything to the stream yeah so we're done writing and then we're staying and waiting for their response here and they're not answering well they're they're not closing the they're not closing the socket maybe they are maybe we need to tell them to close the socket uh, There is some instruction in HTTP to tell the server slash r slash and or somebody is correcting me. But I think they're not just, they're just, uh, uh, they are, I think they're not closing the socket and waiting for the more requests. I think so because they believe that we are that we're gonna send more yeah I'm googling now I think there is some HTTP header there What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna now in in Chrome, I'll just I'll just ins inspect what I'm what Chrome is doing, and I will try to do exactly the same. When Chrome is asking my, is fetching my page, I'll see what kind of request they are sending there. Yeah, I think they're saying connection close. That's my suspicion. Connection. Instead of keep alive, let's say close. I'm trying. Yeah, you see? So I was right. So the server on their side, they were just staying there and by default, they thought, by default it was keep alive. And they were expecting more requests from us. So when I say close, I'm instructing them to close the connection right after the request. So what we're getting back is uh, the response. So we're getting back HTTP response, which has uh, the header line, well, the, the, um, the first line, and then we have a number of headers and then the content of my uh, robots.txt. You see, we just created a small, really primitive HTTP request, HTTP client, which is basically this one class. That's all we need for an HTTP client. It's small, it doesn't do all the fancy stuff which Apache client can do and Google HTTP client can do and this new HTTP client from JDK 9 but it, it, it makes the HTTP request because it's really primitive protocol, request response. But now how to make it more complex? So how can we make it? And, and there are two ways, two directions uh, to make it more powerful. We need some, uh, we need to be able to uh, process the, uh, the answers coming from the server. And we need to be able to uh, create this code, this text, in a more you know convenient way because it's not going to be convenient for users to to write all this in text. I mean, not everybody knows, for example, about this stuff. Not everybody knows about what what's right slash r slash n or slash n slash r. I keep forgetting it all the time. So uh, that's why I started to I created first of all I created a class which I called HT response. Response is an abstraction of two things. One thing is wire, another thing is the, is the request. And it is, and it is, it implements the input. So now we have a class called response, which, which makes the code we have seen just before less procedural. It, uh, it encapsulates two things. One thing is how to deliver the request, 
and the second thing is the request so here's the request the same I'm not changing it and here's the wire and the result is the result it's still the same input what it does inside it's one primitive line look that's exactly what we've done what we were doing before it just calls send HTTP response. Of course, it's going to work again. See? Works fine. Um, the next step is I don't want to read this whole text manually. I don't want to parse this as a text. I want, for example, to know what is the content type. Well, I want to know, yeah, what is the content type uh, the GitHub is returning? So I want that one particular header. So here's what I'm going to do. I create another class, which is, a, as you understand, sort of a decorator. Not a decorator, actually, because it, it's... I don't even know how to call these guys, because look what is going on. It makes, it says this, ht head. First, I'm taking the part of the, re of the response, which is just the head. So this ht head is also an input it's also something which can be read and uh, it encapsulates just one thing which is also an input so this is input this is input but ht head just gonna take this this part of the response only the start before the empty line in http protocol the empty line which goes in, which, which you can see here this empty line is an indicator of the uh, of the, the of this the, the stopping point for the header so this this header this head of the response I want to take it out that's why I'm saying ht head that's why I created this class ht head so it's just will you know take take part of the response let's see how it works you see it's only the head everything else is removed we see only the head and then I say ht headers, which is a map. This ht headers is not an input anymore, it's a map. So it encapsulates the head, this piece of text, and it behaves like a map of headers. So I'm not saying, I'm not calling anyone and saying, hey, could you please parse me the, this piece of information and then return me the map. I'm just decorating the head and saying this is the map and it is a map. I also have a blog post about that, um, I think a few weeks ago, which is called uh, don't parse, uh, use parsing objects. So this is the parsing object. It doesn't, par well, it parses inside, of course. But it doesn't, it, it's not something which you call and say, parse me. It's not a parser. It is just a collection of headers. So all you do is just to give uh, this head to the headers. And then you can say, and then you can say, headers get, because it's a map. And we say content type. Remember, text plane. So let's run it and see what the content type is. boom works fine or we can do another thing let's say I want to know the status of them let's move the head somewhere else this is our head these are our headers and let's say I want to know the status of the response I mean HTTP status, which is 200 in our case. Mm, yeah, unfortunately in Java, integer is not, even if I do it like this, is not really uh, an interface like map. Map is an interface. That's a perfect design. But, you know, JDK designers or Java designers didn't make it an interface. And that's why we are using it like this. So this HD status is a number. Yeah. Like this. Look. So again, I'm not asking some status parser to parse this piece of text and then give me the status. I'm just saying, look, the status is the number. 
and then I want to see the status. Let me comment it out. Let's see the status. Let's run it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's it, it prints the uh, the two string implementation of the status, which is not the number we're looking for. In order to get the number, we say int value. So I want I'm expecting to see 200 now. Yeah, it's 200. That's how it should be in the object-oriented world. If we want more uh, information to get out of there, we'll create more of these parsers, parsing objects or decorators. Here's an interesting thing which I want to show you. Look, if I do it like this, if I say headers and I print the header, that's just interesting effect of being object-oriented and really lazy on data. Uh, so what I'm doing here, I, I, I use this head and I, I encapsulate it inside the, the headers and then from the headers I get the, the type using this method get. So actually when I call get, what will happen, then the parsing of this header of the, of the re HTTP response will happen here because it's all lazy because this constructor is not doing anything it's code free it just encapsulates but doesn't parse this get method will actually do the actual parsing and also this one int value will also do the actual reading of the head and uh, calculating what is the number there I hope you understand what I'm getting at because this code is not going to work now this code will break. I don't know exactly what will break, but I think it's going to be some runtime exception. It looks correct, but you should understand that the parsing of the text, of the input stream actually, will happen two times. Here and here. And since head is an input, which is an input stream basically, we cannot read from the input stream two times the input stream will be empty on the second call. Let's try. Mm -hmm. I was wrong actually. Yeah, I'll look, but it's for some reason it's making the request two times. Look, boom and boom. So we actually went to the, uh, we went to, uh, to GitHub two times. Uh huh. You see, that's that. That's how lazy we are. That. So I was wrong. Saying that, yeah, I was thinking wrong. You see, so this, <laughs> so this head, is a is an abstraction, of the re response from the server, and then we encapsulate it here, and then we ask what's the header, and it goes to it does everything. It, it's not only it, it's not only doing parsing; it goes to the to the server. It it makes the request, and then returns the response, and then parses it. And then I'm saying, okay, I need the status of that, and it does it again, because uh, because it's never cached anywhere, because it's all lazy. So we we never the request was not done here. It was just encapsulated and prepared for the request. And, uh, and and here it was, you know, uh, and, and here we, 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 we used it. So, so that's, that's wrong. We don't want to do it twice. We don't want to go to the server two times, right? We just want to make one request. What do we do? For this case, we have in, uh, in Cactus, we have this primitive, which is called sticky input. So the sticky input, will, it's also a decorator, of course, and it also is an input, so it's a decorator of an input. So this sticky input will, uh, will make sure that we only read once. So every time we'll try to read from head, only the first read will happen, will actually go to the server. And then all consecutive reads, consecutive read operations, will just return the content which is already cached in memory. Let's try and see how it goes.
Yeah, it's exactly what we need. So you see this done writing. It's a line we have from the um, just a debugging line. So now we have this type is here, status is here. So the request was executed just once. And then everything is just that there is somebody's asking on the chat is uh, do you always find proper solutions using the decorator in most cases the decorators just help uh, in most cases like you see now in most cases they help let's say for example i want to uh hear what happens in this wire i you see i'm, I'm logging it here it's not really elegant so let's say i want a proper logging solution in this case, I say uh, I, I want to design a class which is, uh, which is logging wire. I create a decorator, of course. That's my logging wire. And then here to see what's going on, I'm just saying logging wire, boom. And now I run it and I will see when the request is sent. Request sent. If I remove this sticky input, request will be sent twice. Request sent, request sent. See the beauty of it? So we can add new functionality to this design by creating uh, new decorators. So when we put this library on the market and people start using it, they don't need to be uh, connected too much to our interface. Well, to our interfaces, they have to be connected. They have to rely on our interfaces. But look at how primitive they are. This is just one method interface. All others like they, inherit, they implement the input interface, which is also super small. It's also just one method interface. It's from Cactus, you see? It's just one method, public interface input. So it will be easy for everybody to design new, uh, new, new classes to help to make the code better. For example, let's say uh, we want, let's say we want a wire to, you know, to stop on a timeout because now this wire like you've seen before it will just wait and wait endlessly so if I remove this 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 uh, this header connection close then the wire will stay and wait for github to answer I don't know for how long maybe github will drop the connection in a few minutes but we can we have no control over that we, because the cycle is uh, the cycle is uh, you know endless inside cactus so we're going to read and read and the, the socket is not closed we're going to read until it until it until it ends so we want to create another wire which will drop on the timeout so we don't introduce any parameters to wire we don't like it's done in with the uh, with the fluent interfaces or just traditional uh, coding practices which you make this wire more complex like apache is doing google is doing all of these guys are doing they're just making this code configurable by parameters by integer parameters and, and then eventually the code gets huge what we do we create another inter another decorator which we call uh which we call i don't know timed wire the wire which will drop when the connection when the when the when it's um when the time is over and uh, how we do that it depends on the uh, on the implementation most, most probably we're going to start another thread which will watch this one and then just interrupt it when it's too 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 long you're welcome to submit you know your code and and help us implement that so we need your help with this and um, we need your help with more with more classes because now look there are just five classes in the library but it works i mean the, the the connection the connection works we need for example also the wire if i say if it's gonna be 
let's say, uh, because right now we only support uh, port 80, but if we put it 443 for the SSL, for the HTTPS, then it's not going to work because it will, well, it will work, but it will not encode, it will not encrypt the request, it will not decrypt the answer. It will not be able to exchange certificates and all that stuff. So we, are, we only support uh, HTTP now, but no HTTPS. Again, we can create another, co another uh, implementation of the wire. We can call it uh, secure wire, for example, which will be a decorator, for example, which will, uh, when something is coming in, it encrypts it. When something comes back, it decrypts it. We can create many more other decorators for, 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 for other functionalities. And also, one more thing, which I want to mention before we finish, is that I, we need definitely to create something to make this code simpler. Because we don't want it to be text, so we need some, uh, some other approach to build uh, the request code in here. Inside the takes framework, we are using something like that. Uh, we can do it here as well, but I didn't implement it. I want your help in, in that and maybe your thoughts on how we can do it, maybe differently. But in takes, we would do it like this, uh, like request and then new ht with header. For example, uh, host. And then new ht with header again. That's that's how takes framework builds um, builds requests. And then connection close. And so and so. Uh, and then uh, it will all this. I don't have these classes. I'm just provide. I'm just you know making this up. Uh, and then this code will build the request, the, the, the text of the request. Yeah, I, 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 I guess that's how... Uh, not just that's how, I can really like show you the practical example from takes. Uh, Yeah, that's the code from takes. So maybe we don't need to implement anything new, actually. Maybe we can just use requests, uh, request code from takes instead of re-implementing it here. But that's basically, this whole thing will basically create the request, uh, the request, request text. I can, I can print it and show you, uh, look. So this code will build what we need for the for the GitHub server. It's a it's an object-oriented builder, you see. Well, it says host two times. Uh, yeah, because it already had the host in the uh, in the RQ fake implementation, so we can remove it. Do you follow <laughs> how it works? Decorators, decorators, decorators. Yeah, that's exactly what I need. So I can use this piece of code for our for our purpose. We can put it here. Boom. And I hope GitHub will like it. Let's try. Uh -huh, there is no secure wire. 
and we need to get it back. Boom, it works fine, as you see. So maybe we can just tell our customers that, look, just go to take, I mean, use the takes framework. It has all the classes for building HTTP requests. No need to invent anything here. I mean, there is no need to, I mean, to copy all this functionality in here. Uh, maybe this, maybe that way. Or if some of you can introduce, can suggest a new way of object-oriented composition of an HTTP request, we can implement it differently. That was my I mean, original idea to implement something differently, just for the purpose of experimenting, to, to try how we can uh, do, uh, how we can create object-oriented um, builder or creator of text. And, and the problem is that the text is not consecutive. So uh, the text contains the header and contains the body, and the body can be really huge. So the body could be an inter the, the input stream. Um, and the header can may contain lines, which you may want to modify uh, after the, uh, the main object is created. So it's not like String Builder, when you're just adding lines to the, to the end of, this, of, the, of the main uh, data container. In this case, we need to, like I just showed you here, we need to, like, you look without header, with header, with header. So you you, you decorate every time and make the uh, the object more uh, to make the object you make the object bigger and bigger and bigger, but not just appending something to the end of it, but modifying what's inside. Um, uh, let me see the questions people are asking, and we're gonna finish it now uh, yeah the question is why the headers are vertically but not horizontally decorated what's the game um, that's a good question mostly well there is no really we can do it both actually they can be uh, it's possible to to use another class headers and then it will be sort of sort of horizontal decorate well it's not horizontal but it will be like that uh, we can we can use horizontal horizontal decorating as well but I I made it vertical because I don't remember exactly why I can't say what's the what's the game what's the purpose of, 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 of doing it like that maybe when I did that I wasn't really in favor of this uh, horizontal decorating. I don't know. Uh, there are some people asking me what I think about Rust, the language, programming language. Uh, it's probably a good question, but I'm really uh, not a Rust programmer. <clears throat> I have almost zero experience, not almost, but zero knowledge about the language. I'll try to, to take a look at it. Maybe I'll, I'll write some blog posts about it. But I think for now that's it. Uh, I just demonstrated you the, the, the library. What I want you to welcome, I want you to suggest to contribute. It's really small, like you see. It needs your help. It, you may contribute by creating new classes. Uh, it may become bigger. It is an experimental library, of course, but it is useful. If you want really object-oriented way of making an HTTP request and you want it to be extendable, let's try it out. I think it's this concept, this architecture is better than, than Fluent Interfaces for maintainability because all classes are small, like, like you see here. No matter how complex is the idea, no matter how much functionality you want to add, it's just a small piece of code, one class focused on only one thing. It could be a decorator, it can be uh, these parsing objects, it can be some smart objects, but they're all small. That's the point. That's the beauty of, of, of that's, the, uh, that's the virtue of, of software. It has to be small. It has to be um, solid, cohesive, small. Use any word you like. Thanks for listening. See you next uh, month. It's Wednesday, 11 a.m. PST, uh, Pacific Time. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Bye-bye.